know, I've learned more about football during my short time at Cass Business School than probably any other period in my life. And one of the reasons for that is the, well, the lectures I've had from Professor Stefan Szymanski, economist extraordinaire. You'll see him really whenever a football finance story appears pretty much on every media outlet, the BBC, Sky News, the newspapers, everywhere else. And, um, well, his latest thesis, his latest idea, probably to put it more correctly, is that um, the football crisis that you've probably noticed, Manchester United, Portsmouth, is quite like the banking crisis. I asked him why. I think there's a very close similarity, and that comes down to this basic economic concept of moral hazard. So the managers in the banking system, as we now know, were taking wild risks that were unreasonable, gambling the future of their bank in the hope that they would make lots of money and become very successful. And the reason they were prepared to do that was because they didn't see a downside. They knew that if the bank got into trouble, then they'd be bailed out somehow or, or another. So there was really no downside risk to them engaging in this gambling. And that led to the crisis that we know as the banking crisis. Well, a similar thing it really has been going on in football for many years, and not just in this country, but across uh, in, most, in most football markets. And that is that the, the club owners and the club managers gamble on success by buying players that they can barely afford, hoping that the, the team succeeds and then that will bring in the fans and that will pay off the debt. But also knowing that if they can't pay off the debt, then someone will come and rescue the football club eventually. But if it all goes wrong at Manchester United, Malcolm Glazer is going to be financially wiped out. The Glazer situation, if you like, is, is slightly different from the, from the typical um, football crisis that we see. What's happened with the Glazers is it's really um, their investment in Manchester United is like a giant buy-to-let scheme. They, they bought the club by using borrowed money, just like you might buy a house with a mortgage and then rent it out to somebody whose uh, monthly rental payments pays off your interest and on the debt and you end up owning the house using somebody else's uh, rental payments. Well, the Glazers are doing a similar thing because the, the, the people renting the club, if you like, are the fans who pay ever-increasing ticket prices Though uh, they buy merchandise, they obviously, of course, they generate um, TV uh, rights revenues as well. Those monies are paying off the debt. And eventually, if it works for the Glazers, they end up owning the club. That's a more stable situation, potentially, than the situation that clubs like Portsmouth at the foot of the, of the Premier League or many of the other clubs in the lower divisions that have gone into admi administration face. They're the ones who are the gamblers because they've been gambling on getting into a position like Manchester United's. Um, Manchester United are already there. It's what's happening at Portsmouth. It looks like it's going horribly, horribly wrong. Well, again, it, it's, it's, it's the classic problem, um, spending money that you were unable to afford. Um, but also, there's been a problem with the ownership. So the club has been sold off. It's been sold um, to owners who... Uh, promised that they were going to be able to invest money, but actually don't seem to be able to do so now uh, in practice. And that's um, really a letdown for the club, uh, a letdown for the fans who, who've been made promises. And, and this, I'm afraid, is often the case with football finance. The fans are promised lots of things by new owners, but frequently they're incapable of delivering. Yes, during all this, a, a little-known fact has emerged, and that is, if a football club goes bankrupt, then the football debts, the football creditors, get paid first. Football, the football creditor rule is an, a remarkable rule in, in, in any tax system, certainly unique in the British tax system, which says that if the club is, cannot pay its debts, the first people in line to be paid off are other football clubs and, other football, and footballers who are owed wages. Um, ahead of the taxman, which is quite extraordinary. And unfortunately, this rule actually feeds the craziness. It actually, again, encourages the club to think that it doesn't need to pay its debts. It doesn't need to worry about the taxman. And it also encourages the other football clubs and, the, and the, uh, the, those who govern the Premier League and the other leagues to not to pay attention to the debts of other clubs because they know they'll get paid anyway. Yes, our football clubs real businesses or, or even real case studies in economics? Well, they're certainly great case studies in economics, but whether they're proper businesses or not is, is quite another question. They're certainly businesses that struggle to make any money. 
the business model works uh, really on the basis that you want to succeed on the field in order to generate a bigger fan base, in order to generate more revenue. The problem is only one club can come top of the league, only one club can come second in the league and so on. So there's a limited number of slots and in the competition to reach one of those slots, the clubs end up eating up all the potential profits in the industry and more. Yes, another comparison with the banking crisis. In banking, it's the bankers who are being paid a fortune, getting these enormous bonuses. And in football, it's the players. There is a, it's certainly true that the players and the senior bankers get paid very large sums of money. In the case of the players, though, we know that they are being paid for something they deliver. The wages that players are paid very closely reflect their productivity. What, you're suggesting bankers aren't earning their money? There's some question. There's not good evidence to demonstrate that bankers generate the income that matches the salaries that they're paid. That's certainly true. So, um, but, the, uh, but there is a question there about whether um, the... Uh, clubs should be allowed to spend to quite the degree that they are. Some people propose that we should have closer regulation of football club and their spending should be limited in the way that happens in France and Germany. Although others will say that that just invites uh, a system of corrupt governance to replace the, the mismanagement that you see today. Are there any lessons from the banking crisis that could perhaps sort out the crisis in football finance? Well, I think one of the things we've realized in banking is that tighter regulation is required and there is a need to ensure all of us against the systemic risks that banks undertake and, and indeed to prevent banks taking excessive risk. Um, the one question in the football industry though is really who the victims really are of the moral hazard and the financial irresponsibility. Um, certainly a lot of investors have lost their money but well might say who cares about that. Um, you could also say that the fans lose if their team goes into administration but these clubs never disappear they're always reborn in another guise and okay a team may go down a division or two but that just means the fans of another team go up a division or two so in some sense that balances out. Um, uh, so it's not clear that there are any real victims in the football crisis apart perhaps from the tax man and maybe we need to be concerned about that, and, and perhaps some of the smaller creditors who get left aside, like the St. John's Ambulance Brigade, which is clearly a, a disgraceful um, failure on the part of clubs to pay them their debts. Briefly, everyone who comments on this is miserable, and yet I look at you and you're happy. You're sitting there, you're an optimist. Why? Well, I'm an economist as well as an optimist. <laughs> And to me, what's really in the best interest of us as consumers is cutthroat competition. I don't like to see businesses making lots of money. What that tells me is they're able to charge high prices and not pass on those, the, any cost savings to the customer. So when I see cut clubs and businesses living on the edge, I actually think that's a rather good thing because it suggests that competition is working for the consumer. Stefan Szymanski, thank you very much indeed. Don't forget, plenty more on the Cast Talks blog. The address, as always, alexritson.com.